Robert started to cast his eyes along the shadowy depths of this place. Some strange mannequin stood in mummified wrappings. Short clipped sounds and enigmatic words echoed through the dusty old crypt. Though it all felt so distant one moment, the next it felt so close and extremely jarring, as well as frightening. His blood is disease. He heard the words again and again. His home, the web, so dreams the spider. It chanted in his thoughts. So dreams the spider. An insane laughter broke out, leaving Robert <laughs> clasping his senses with his hands. Robert slowly rose to his feet and began to walk, hesitantly at first, towards the doorway in his dream state. The moment he entered the next room, the sight that was presented made him feel terribly uneasy. The room for all its size was like a tomb, dim and orange, with the glow of fire. The muse felt his own blood run cold suddenly. The faint sound of Eric Satie's music echoed from a dusty old gramophone. Robert discerned this strange trickling composition as he entered. Robert awoke with a start. He recognized an old and familiar face peering down at him, while his eyes gradually began to focus. Asru? He asked, confused. Is it you? But how? I, I was in Italy. I, I was... I don't remember. Lay still, Robert. I can't until you tell me what has happened. She drew in a quick breath as she explained. You came to me. Don't you remember? You were knocking on my door. You were agitated, afraid. You were ranting about some dream you'd experienced. Terrible night terrors. Then... She hesitated. What? He asked suddenly. Tell me. I have to know. You told me someone had been killed. Two security guards from a hospital. Robert sat there distracted by the sudden stabs of memory that all too quickly came flooding back to him. He pictured the bodies, bloodied, lying on the floor. Robert blinked. He was struck by the fear again. But then came the dream, the fearful, nightmarish visions and hallucinations, the spider in its trance-like parlor, that face cast in clay, appearing like some alien figure. The eyes, black and large and elliptical. Fingers long and tapered to fine, sharp tips. Then waking suddenly to discover the two men lying dead at his feet. That wicked laughter. He remembered that too. It echoed in his head. Robert gazed at Asru suddenly. A heavy questioning fell on his expression. I don't understand, he said, giving in to sudden shakes. His lips started quivering. I killed them, didn't I? No, Robert, Asru said quickly, trying to steady his arms with her soothing touch. Yes, I must have. Who else could it have been? My memory of the past few days, I don't know. Things remain a total blur, while some things are coming more lucid, like the corpses in the hospital, and that god-awful dream. Tell me what you do remember, Azru prompted. I remember being at the hospital. There was a young telepath. I remember that. I stayed with her. She had been placed in some kind of coma. Her thoughts had requested my presence. I tried to reach her with my own thoughts. I believed that if I could just make her hear me, she would wake up. After that, I remember nothing. 
I don't recall anything that happened except for a few broken memories. Dreams. Well, nightmares, really. I don't even remember coming here to your apartment, Asru. I feel terrible. Tell me about these dreams. Tell me more about the creature you encountered. Robert looked away suddenly, trying to recollect as well as make sense of the recent imagery. The creature rose up in front of him, gray and gangly, a tall, slender individual. It wore a mask, tall and featureless, except for two elliptical eyes that seemed to stare down into his very soul. Robert pulled himself back from his reveries. Looking Asru in the eye, he remained for a second or two, as though struck by an epiphany. Like a sudden whirlwind, he was on his feet. He made a dash for the washroom upstairs. His breathing was shallow. Robert stared at his reflection in the mirror, his left arm resting on the wash basin, his other hand placed against his chest to measure the rhythm of his heartbeat. He quickly felt his knees give way beneath him. Robert? Asru cried as she entered, kneeling before her friend. The muse felt her hands pressed against his flesh suddenly. The gentle warmth of her touch was soothing. Slowly, Robert got up. I remember, he said. That face! I remember! He began to walk to the door. Asru's gaze followed him as Robert exited, entering the adjoining room, Asru's bedroom. She followed. A tinge of curiosity bloomed into a look of suspicion. I've seen it, he told her, kneeling before her bed. The muse was agitated, pulling old items from beneath her mattress. Boxes, small wooden chests full of aged jewelry, letters, and an old Egyptian mask. He lifted it out bringing it into the light before Azru's astonished gaze. There! That is the face of the creature that attacked me! Azru was speechless. How could Robert have known about this mask, an old keepsake she had hidden, for what seemed like, well, forever? They both went back downstairs. Seated together, Azru could tell that her young friend had questions about this particular item he still had tightly gripped in his hands. She finally figured now was a good time as any to explain her past. That mask you are holding is the death mask of a pharaoh. The one he might have worn in his final rest had his life not met with quite a violent and troubling end. Robert's gaze turned from the object in question and rose to meet Azru's. A very long time ago, I was indeed the handmaid to the powerful prince, Amenhotep. This poor, beautiful boy was torn violently from his god after his father died. In fact, it drove him to madness. Amenhotep grew resentful, and in an untold fit of rage, this prince renounced his god, Amun-Ra. Of course, Ra was furious and punished the boy. Amenhotep survived that terror, but he only grew more resolute, more defiant. He started by having the temples torn down and the priests stripped of their power. All that remained was a vacuum, a spiritual vacuum. It was... It was swiftly replaced with another god, the Aten. After that, it was clear that our prince had lost his mind. He began to babble of the new god to worship, and he himself henceforth would be known as Akhenaten, the destroyer of gods. What happened to him? Asked Robert after a pause. Azru drew in a breath. No one really knows. Some say that Amun-Ra sent a messenger to dispatch him. Some people said the prince was infected by a demon's disease, a malady that has slept for centuries beneath the sands of Egypt. 
Only the gods know for certain. Robert looked down at the mask. I'm afraid to sleep. Azru regarded him with question. Maybe, Robert, there is nothing in all of this but a situation that sparked a memory. Nothing more. Maybe you remember this mask from the last time you were here and something reignited it. Then what does that make me, Asru? She didn't respond. Does that make me some kind of latent killer? Why? Do you think you killed those men? Well, what else could it have been? Be honest with me. Robert, you are not a killer. Now don't be silly. You need rest. You are physically exhausted. I will leave the light on in the hallway. I'll only be next door if you need me, okay? Robert nodded hesitantly. Who can decipher dreams? What do dreams signify or expose in times of deep questioning? This dream had a certain realism to it, like a memory, a seed that had been carried in some temporal wind from a long time ago, saturated his subconscious mind. The reverie was confusing, out of sequence, as dreams often are. In his subconscious eye, he witnessed a troubled coronation, a headpiece encrusted with bright and fiery jewels, was lowered over the creature's head. He looked like a man, regal and powerful, though the creature, within his flesh, like some evil spawning pit, was not human. Robert could identify this fact, even if the priests and the attendees could not. As swiftly as this image had come, it was gone again replaced by a much lighter vision. At that moment, Robert felt he was standing alone in what appeared to be a large chamber. Only a single window let in the sunlight above. The muse had to stand on tiptoe in order to witness the breathtaking sight that presented itself. The city of Akhetaten, the Golden City, Robert could see the huge sloping walls as they descended towards the main city wall at the very edge. Magnificent. This is where it all began. The evil, much like a Pandora's box, fueling the demon. It was the ego in its infancy, struggling against the id, emblazoned on this deity like purity and majesty. The demon's spawn. Nothing within itself, yet powerful enough to turn the world into darkness, making it less and less. It was like a vibration or tone, influencing the fullness of life with a hopelessness that was unwarranted. It should not have been worth a second thought, but there it remained, like a cancer on the human skin. Robert stepped back from the window. He felt again the dampness of the matted floor beneath his feet. He started to tread very slowly and quite tentatively. He felt something touch his back. He spun round and noticed an arrangement of coarse textiles like blankets suspended from clotheslines. He allowed his curious nature to get the better of him. The textiles brushed against his face and swept over his head as he advanced unhurriedly through these partitioned spaces. He advanced further, brushing more textile drapes to one side. In the next section of partitions, Robert caught sight of a golden manger. It was large and woven, woven from a precious metal, or so it seemed. He noticed Azru. She was kneeling, peering over the raised edge of the manger. She was whispering something to the child. Maybe he caught a lullaby, he could not say. 
She seemed completely oblivious to Robert's presence as he stood there, a mere spectator in the dream. He continued to watch as Azru performed the timeless ritual of the muse, presenting this infant with the gift of the afflatus. It was only a short ceremony, a transference of mystical energy. The boy was the infant, Amenhotep. He reached upwards to her with dainty fingers. Soon, this venerable ritual was over. Azru leaned over to kiss the child on the forehead, offering her final blessing. The scene passed once again. This time, the shifting web of Phantasmagoria depicted a much older Amenhotep. He was with his faithful muse. They lay side by side, stretched out on a long rug. He was laughing as Azru talked. However, his face seemed mildly obscure to the spectator, as though it was the product or manifestation of a vague memory a memory that was struggling to resurface. Then, they began to kiss and caress each other like lovers. Had they been lovers? Robert saw in a shifting spectacle yet another union taking place, a ceremony of marriage. In this avowed ritual, he witnessed the slightly older heir, Akhenaten, as he was later known. He was bonded to his queen, Nefertiti, the beauty from an earlier image. He also witnessed the bearers, these small children, holding the robes of their queen as she took the hand of her king. From where Robert was standing, he could clearly see his poor jilted Azra as she peered out from behind a curtain. The procession progressed, moving to the sound of the slow music. As the pharaoh stopped and kneeled before the dais, the high priest, a tall, lean man, dressed in priesthood robes, gave a prayer. Robert turned and looked back, but Azra was no longer present. He shifted quickly towards the curtain where she had been standing. She was gone. Poor Azru. This had been a great betrayal. Akhenaten had cast her aside for a woman who was every bit as fair as she. The scene shifted. The fire burned ever higher, and the very surroundings, the air itself, crackled and droned with the sounds of demonic creatures, hideous, transparent monsters, that soared, dancing in and around the licking flames. They dashed from the conflagration like firecrackers, escaping their world like ghosts. Their ugly shrieks and cries were like the howling of the wind. This noise resounded across the land of the free, bringing with it a sickness and trembling among many of the denizens. It was a sickness that would one day bring dysfunction. A malady that would in some point in the distant future bring in the age of disassociation. All the natural things in life would wilt and perish. Children were woken from their sleep. The horror had been burned into their sights. It was as though they had been given awareness complex enough to mourn mankind for that briefest of moments. Light began to strobe in the distance, and then died as the sand in the storm made its grisly announcement felt. Everywhere, dreams were tormented. The face, that horrible face from the first dream remained, leering and grinning, and in two behind its terrible mask. Like the last time, it was long, elongated, 
with the wily narrow eyes. It came to panic the people in their fitful sleep. Robert saw a man running for his very life. His eyes filled with terror as he turned to look at his persecutor. A deep guttural scream loosed from his maw as he stumbled, attempting to claw his way through the flotsam of his chaotic mind. What was this curse? What did it mean? Was it born out of Azru's jealousy? Had Azru unleashed it somehow? Again, this dreadful vista changed quite suddenly as the phantasmal allegory began to unfold. Robert looked and witnessed soldiers with guns and uniforms. He saw them tearing away at ancient crumbling sandstone, hauling great blocks of it away to try to reach something hidden. He noticed the badges and runes on their necklines, as well as the highlighted swastikas on their arms. There was plenty of shouting. A tall lieutenant colonel barked orders in German. Come on! Hurry it up! We are almost there! The first beam of light began to flood into the burial chamber. This ancient room and all its ancient treasures were at last fully illuminated. Dust and rubble, stone that had perhaps stood untouched for thousands of years, was suddenly brought toppling to the floor. Beams from flashlights illuminate ancient hieroglyphs. Come! It must be here somewhere! The lieutenant colonel shouted. The search went on for an hour. The German raiders found nothing. Next, Robert saw an immense, barren region of sand. It was evening, and these same uniformed men were back at their base encampment. There were tents, and all-terrain vehicles pitched and parked. Soldiers were drinking, laughing, and talking loudly among themselves. A campfire blazed. Some were in their tents sleeping. One man screamed out suddenly. Help! Help! The other officers, hearing the sudden outbursts, came running. The stricken officer's eyes were wide with fear. His cheeks were wet from the tears he had shed in the darkest depths of that monstrous tomb. What is it? asked the others. The man lay there, panic-stricken, shouting, He came for me! Who? one of the other officers asked. The man, shaking, looked up at the officer standing over him. Chaos! Death! The vision changed once more. People in a room suddenly surrounded Robert. Each of them, he noticed, were wearing bands tied around their arms. The Star of David. He looked round. The scene changed again. He was in a hospital filled with the sick and malnourished. Children with deformities cried for their parents. Doctors told them everything would be all right. A boy with short blonde hair was receiving an injection. The sight of these other people repulsed Robert, who was suddenly forced to watch. Their skin was covered in lesions. Robert could hear the screams of each victim. He noted their eyes, carved in glaze behind their bloody skulls. The souls of the released were removed from the horror of their incarceration at last. A dream state, a brief heightened nightmare beyond death, hurled them into silent waiting oblivion. Silence, finally. Robert looked round. There by his side lay his recent victims. Who? Indeed, what had brought him back to this dreadful memory? Death and disease had taken them. They all died in their sleep, 
dreaming, dreaming of that creature with the mask. The vision passed. A huge chamber greeted his gaze. He was back in Egypt. He was there once more. Robert felt the nerves prickle in the back of his neck. Akhenaten's mask-like face leered with those monstrous, black eyeless sockets. The death mask itself. My slow arrow of beauty, he said. These cryptic words filled Robert with a terrible anguish. Then the words evaporated, much like dew on a blade of grass. This devil too, it seemed, evaporated. Robert was in another place, grand, austere, a place of infinite size that could not be measured. There was marble, there were columns and doorways, arches and paintings. This was new. He had not encountered a place as fine as this in his previous reveries. He stood up and began to look around. Where was he? What was this place? He moved from one room only to be greeted by another and another and then another. No one else was here apart from the dreamer. He was alone. Or was he? In the corner of his eye, he could have sworn he saw a shape move swiftly out of sight. Hello, Robert said. No response. He stepped up to a shroud. Or was it a curtain? He felt an odd sensation at last. No, no, it was not a curtain. It was a mask. He felt it pressed against his face. He could barely breathe but it felt as if some weight was being lifted from his very soul. A presence, not his own, was being taken from his features. What was happening to him? Some time passed as Robert rested. Eventually he woke to discover Azru was gone. He just assumed she had left to run some errands though she never returned. Robert waited and waited. He sat, drinking hot ambrosia from his favorite mug. The day seemed to draw on without a single sign of his friend. Where could she have gone? Robert went upstairs to wash his face finally. He looked up at the mirror in front of him. The terrible, nightmarish dreams had gone. His own beautiful, ageless face reflected back at him. That mask, it was no longer there. It was gone. And with it, Azru too had absconded. And she did not return. Ever. This clearly had seemed increasingly odd to Robert as he sat there alone in her sitting room, dwelling on the issue. The clock on the mantelpiece gave its tiny, though audible tick as he sat, endeavoring to make sense of this. She wasn't coming back, he thought. The realization entered his mind at that precise moment. He had come full circle, hadn't he? This house was where it all began, his first friendship. Azru had been there for him from the very start. Now it felt like she had abandoned him as he had once abandoned her. He would have to move on. There was no other alternative. He got up finally, making a conscious effort. He left that house and never returned.